First of all, the reason why this video took me so long to make was because of the large amount of research I needed for it. Second of all, I'll give you a brief summary of all the text I'll be showing during this video. I do this so it doesn't take forever for you to read all the text, and so that you don't miss a crucial thing if you look away briefly. The text I show will contain context, details, and sources for those of you who want to know more. If you are just listening to this video, remember there will be pictures and diagrams that are important to see. I also want to mention that the purpose of this video is to inform the general public, hunters, and aspiring game rangers about practical details. Generally, people like game rangers or PHs will already know most of the things from personal experience. I will be mostly talking about elephant, but I will also include other dangerous creatures like lion, leopard, and cape buffalo. People will rightfully want to know why I would talk about killing elephants when they are listed as an endangered species by the IUCN. I have two main reasons for this, and the first is counterintuitively related to conservation. In places where elephants are protected from poaching, but humans don't want to properly manage the elephant population, the result is inevitably overpopulation. Elephant overpopulation is extremely damaging to the environment, and responsible, scientifically informed people want to preserve the environment for all the animals dependent on it, not just elephants. The second reason is related to public safety and the inherent desire to preserve human life. Elephants are intelligent large creatures, and some of them decide to kill people, usually by crushing or goring. According to the statistics I am showing, elephants kill roughly 500 people a year. Finally, I will be mentioning rifles and calibers that are generally not legal for use in hunting dangerous game. I am not suggesting people break the laws, but rather the laws should be changed to allow their use. I'm going to start off with a forum post about the shortcomings of different rifles that were discovered during the Zimbabwe Professional Hunter Proficiency Exam. Obviously you may have one of these rifles mentioned and have no problems whatsoever. The first rifle I will mention is the Weatherby, and the main problem is that if they are knocked around enough while loaded and on safe, they will fire on their own. A separate problem is the fact that with Weatherby factory ammo, particularly the 460 Weatherby, can cause problems with extraction because of the high pressure in hot weather. So if you load your own ammo, you can avoid this problem. Don Heath, the author of this article, has a very low opinion of Remington 700 rifles. The main reasons for this is that they take longer to reload than other bolt actions and extractor breaking problems. He mentions that the extraction problems seem to be limited to rifles chambered in 416 and 375 H&H, while the 458 Win Mag ones are pretty reliable. I believe the reason that this is happening has to do with the length of the case. Both 416 Remington and 375 H&H have fairly long cases compared to 458 Win Mag. I think that the longer cases are causing more friction, and this could make them harder to extract. I am not 100% positive that this is the case, and I'd be willing to hear alternative explanations if you have one. Now for Ruger rifles. Don Heath explains that the original M77 and the Mark II version would jam if you ran the action quickly. The problem being that at high speed the ejector will pass right by the empty casing. This doesn't happen if you run the bolt slowly or at moderate speeds though. I assume since the newer Ruger Hawkeye line of rifles have a different type of ejector, they don't have this problem. Don Heath has less to say about the Browning A-Bolt because there weren't enough in use at the time to make a proper judgment on. He did mention that the one rifle needed the floor plate to be beat back into place. Also, Don mentioned he really liked the safety. He also believes that the Winchester Model 70 is the best of the American guns, but it has a glaringly obvious problem. The safety is on the wrong side for both the right-handed and the left-handed rifles. He also mentions that the rear sight is really bad, but doesn't explain why. Finally, the stocks will crack unless you have them properly bedded. The Bruno slash CZ rifles were the most commonly used at the proficiency exam because they were both affordable and generally well made. Sadly, they aren't made anymore. They did have two problems though. First of all, 
The safety was both on the wrong side of the rifle and had a tendency to get accidentally turned on. The second problem was that the 458 Win Mags would not reliably feed soft point ammo. You could get this problem fixed if you had a gunsmith rechamber it in 458 lot. Finally, like other rifles, the stock would also crack unless you bedded it. This shouldn't come as a surprise to you, but a lot of malfunctions in high stress situations are caused by the user not cycling the bolt correctly. Most dangerous game rifles are built with magnum length actions, and since the action is so long, people are more likely to short stroke it. WDM Bell mentioned that this is one of the reasons he dislikes such rifles. Since that forum post was written a while ago, it did not include more recently introduced rifles like the Savage 110 Brush or the Mossberg Patriot. Both are chambered in 375 Ruger and are very affordable. The 375 Ruger is less prone to short stroking because it is intended to use a long action rifle, just like the 30-06 is, instead of a magnum action. I should also mention that since Remington became Rem Arms, they are not making rifles in large calibers like 375 H&H. In conclusion, no matter what type of rifle you have, make sure you practice running it fast and under stress with different types of ammo before you trust your life on it. Some people believe a muzzle brake should be used, but with large bore rifles, the muzzle blast is simply unacceptable. Dr. Kevin Robertson recommends that a 375 H&H rifle should weigh 10 pounds. Most 375 rifles aren't that heavy, so you could use various ways to weigh it down, or you could use a suppressor to both reduce recoil and increase weight. A suppressor, of course, will change the balance of the rifle and provide a much more comfortable experience to anyone nearby. I want to talk about rifle actions now. Double barrel rifles offer a fairly quick follow-up shot and because of this they are better than bolt actions for headshots on an animal that is charging at you from 10 feet away. However, even with a bolt action and its greater capacity, it does not have enough rounds for when things really go downhill. If you have a lever action in 4570, it is capable of taking dangerous game of any species, but it does not meet the minimum energy requirements set into law. Finally, I believe that the best action is semi-automatic because of the fast fire rate and recoil reduction. Again, we run into the problem that in most African countries, semi-autos are not legal for hunting. In this video, I will be critical of the conventional wisdom and the people who don't question it. You have to understand, for a very long time, the conventional wisdom was that the earth is flat. A lot of people assume that a conventional wisdom is true and never start to question it until something major happens that forces them to re-examine their beliefs. I will now be showing quotations from a forum post written by Dr. Joe Hall. I will be explaining what is and isn't true and what is misleading about some of the things he says. First of all, he talks about what is a sensible and adequate caliber for following elephants in thick brush. When we talk about what is or isn't a sensible and adequate caliber, this brings us into the realm of subjective opinion. Subjective opinions are far less useful than objective facts, and I'll mention a fact that is actually useful. The fact that you can shoot a moderately recoiling semi-auto rifle much faster than a heavy recoiling bolt action is an advantage because you can make a quick follow-up shot and possibly kill the elephant before it goes into thick brush. Also, if you are already in thick brush, faster follow-up shots can give you a greater chance of killing a charging elephant before it kills you. The statement about what is a sensible caliber for following elephants in thick brush also implies that small caliber rounds are not as effective. Now you could make an argument that small caliber bullets are more likely to deflect, but even large caliber bullets at slow speeds will also deflect in brush. Small calibers obviously can be effective in such situations. This is a case where a game warden killed an elephant in dense brush at close range, a few paces away with a 7mm rifle. 
To give you an idea of the lighting conditions and how dense the brush was, they could just about make out the outline of this elephant at roughly 10 paces away. Dennis D. Lyell has used many calibers and hunted many elephants. He makes the important point that if you are hunting in dense jungle and you can't see well enough to make a hit on the vitals, you shouldn't try to make such a shot. This obviously doesn't apply to the person who is just walking through thick brush and is charged by an angry elephant. I should probably also mention that based on his extensive experience, Dennis Lyell believes that a caliber that is larger than 350 is not needed in Africa nor anywhere else in the world. Again, this is a subjective opinion, but equally worth mentioning. Dr. Joe Hall mentions the dangers of making poor shots and using inadequate calibers. Since he didn't give any examples, I wanted to. Before smokeless powder, people used large caliber black powder weapons generally incapable of penetrating through the front of an elephant's skull. After people started using smokeless powder, it was generally the bullet construction that failed instead of the cartridge. Samuel White Baker mentioned that only once did he ever manage to penetrate through the front of the skull of an elephant with a 10 bore rifle. This exceptional incident seemed to be due to the fact that the elephant in question was female, so her skull was smaller and less thick. A different author had more luck with a slightly angled side brain shot to make up for the low penetration of weapons like the 10 bore. Sadly, he does a really poor job of describing such a shot. What he is trying to say is that you should be facing the side of the elephant and standing roughly within 15 yards from it, just slightly in front of it. As you face the elephant, you shoot into the side of the skull, through the temple, and into the brain. Dr. Joe Hall talks about how you need to have a rifle that can turn a charging elephant at close range and how it's important to have a large caliber with a strongly constructed bullet that is blunt in shape. First of all, for those of you who don't know, having a very blunt, aka flat nose bullet makes it less likely that the bullet will deflect off the skull at a poor angle, and having a strongly constructed bullet ensures that it will not flatten out on the elephant's skull. Second, the rifle is not actually what determines whether the charge is stopped or turned. It is the elephant that decides this. You can take the elephant's decision out of the equation if your shot hits the brain or spine. Dr. Joe is not alone in his belief that small calibers can't stop charging elephants. Tony Sanchez also holds this easily disproven belief. If Mr. Sanchez had taken the time to read one of Bell's books, he would discover that a 7mm rifle can immediately drop an elephant with a frontal brain shot. What is also very interesting is that Mr. Sanchez wants to make a distinction that a bullet's ability to kill actually has nothing to do with its ability to stop a charging elephant. This argument would only make sense if he was making the distinction that specific rounds can kill with a heart shot, for example, but don't have the penetration needed for the frontal brain shot. Instead of making this distinction, he makes some other supporting arguments, which I will include in the quote. But since I prove most of what he says is not exactly accurate throughout this video, I'll just charitably say it's a little misleading. Obviously, the reason why Dr. Joe Hall likes large, very powerful cartridges is because he believes that smaller 7mm and 6.5mm cartridges would not have stunned an elephant with a shot that hits the head but misses the brain. If you look at W.D.M. Bell's book, Wanderings of an Elephant Hunter, you find that the 7mm round Bell was using was perfectly capable of stunning an elephant in the same manner as the 450 Ackley has done. Most people don't seem to acknowledge this, but a large powerful caliber can fail to penetrate an elephant's skull, while a smaller caliber with much less power may not have this problem. This is due to the fact that a larger diameter projectile has to overcome much more resistance to achieve the same penetration. To illustrate this, I'll use some real world examples. Bruce Bryden was a game ranger in Africa. He had to shoot many dangerous elephants during this time. He recalls that many rangers had penetration problems with their 458 Win Mag rifles. Just to be clear, they were using non-expanding rounds. Because of these shortcomings, he got to try out an experimental rifle chambered in the more powerful 458 watts. 
He shot an elephant in the head with this rifle at roughly 7 yards. The bullet hit the jaw and deflected off. The elephant wasn't stunned or significantly hurt because it ran away. Obviously, this wasn't a good shot angle, but your life may depend on the bullet's ability to penetrate well, even with a bad angle. This is why Bruce was clearly not impressed with the lack of performance. Just to be clear, Bruce had always liked the 375 H&H because it had better penetration than the 458 Win Mag. This is why he gave up on the 458 Win Mag and bought himself a 375 rifle to use for his job. These 458 Win Mag penetration problems resulted in the death of at least one person. Tim Wellington was a game ranger who shot an elephant in the head with a 500 grain bullet. The elephant was not stunned by this and promptly killed the unlucky Mr. Wellington. This bullet only penetrated roughly 4 inches into the elephant's skull. Though the source says the problems of penetration lasted a few years, I have seen varying statements about how long these problems lasted. The problem was that the 458 rounds used at the time lacked the velocity needed for reliable penetration. When the Department of National Parks and Wildlife Management in Zimbabwe switched to higher velocity rounds, these rounds proved to be reliably effective for the crucial frontal shots on large elephant bulls. Interestingly, even though 460 Weatherby has much more velocity and energy than the 458 Wind Mag, it only gives you about 8 more inches of penetration. This reinforces the point that larger diameter bullets can limit penetration. I wanted to mention another case where it was not a lack of velocity that was the problem, but rather too much velocity. Peter Capstick had shot an elephant in the head with a 458 Wind Mag and immediately noticed two things, greatly increased recoil and the fact that the elephant was totally unfazed. Capstick almost died because of this, and the only reason he survived was because a friend threw a water bag at the elephant, which distracted it long enough for Capstick to reload and kill it. The reason the one round had failed to be effective was because the bullet had been driven deep into the case due to the recoil of multiple previous rounds. This had the effect of greatly increasing the pressure of the round to dangerous levels and consequently increasing the velocity of the bullet past the point where it could be sufficiently stabilized by the twist rate. This bullet had hit the elephant while unstable, penetrated only 2 inches, and then skimmed around the skull until it stopped at the back of the head. Finally, I wanted to mention that bullet technology was not so good back in the olden days. During a, this test, a 1970s era Winchester made bullet was shot into an elephant's leg bone and fragmented. Obviously both 375 and 458 caliber bullets were being made with the same era of bullet technology. It's just that the 458 bullets had the additional problem of insufficient velocity. You may have noticed a trend from some of these stories. Large caliber rifles don't always knock out or stun elephants when they get shot in the head. In fact, some elephants that were shot in the head with the incredibly powerful 700 Nitro Express did not react at all. This also proves that John Taylor's famous knockout values are basically useless. We can learn a few things from this. First of all, using a very large diameter bullet for elephant hunting can be quite counterproductive. The large diameter can limit penetration enough that you may need to make follow-up shots. Minimal penetration might be tolerable if it was in a low recoiling semi-auto rifle that enables you to make quick follow-up shots, but that's not what we're talking about. The heavy recoil that inevitably comes with large bore rifles not only forces you to take extra time to recover from the recoil and regain the sight picture, but it also generally makes people shoot noticeably less accurately. So with large heavy recoiling calibers, you may have an ineffective headshot on a charging elephant at close range, which means you may be crushed to death before you could fire again. It also means that if you are hunting and the frontal shot was ineffective, the elephant may be turned away sideways or be completely turned around to flee by the time you can fire again. To continue on this note, if you have a 577 Nitro Express that has low velocity ammo at roughly 1850 feet per second, you will also see failures to penetrate the brain. I'm saying this to warn people about the limits of their cartridges, not because I think 577 Nitro is a particularly good elephant round. 